Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Speaking Legally, where the legal meets the cultural. We're here with you every Wednesday, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with our two legal experts, Edward Pichardo Esquire, Royce Russell Esquire. We thank you for being here, for viewing, for sharing the broadcast, and being such loyal members of the community where we can have real conversation and information that can lead you to having better acknowledgement of what's really happening i'm so i'm i'm working on containing myself through this show so you all extend me some grace because i'm hot there's so much to talk about so much is happening in real time but if you go back to our previous season we talked about some of this our two legal experts shared some of this information so i'm going to pause so they can say hello this is one you want to tag your friends you want to share it because we're going to get into what we're really seeing and not just the emotional side of it but really what's happening and how we need to show up push policy for changes that have to happen in order for us to survive this thing called life so welcome to the show everyone over to you attorney edward Pichardo. hello everyone when i started this good afternoon uh welcome back to the show I think you're going to find, as usual, the show to be very educational and fulfilling. So thank you for attending. Thank you, Senor Pichardo. And over to you, Mr. Royce Russell Esquire. How are you? Well, once again, uh, I'm doing fine. Welcome to all our faithful listeners and newcomers, first time but not long time listeners. Uh, come on in and, and hear the word. Um, oftentimes, people talk about uh, legal commentators and analysts. They refer to them as talking heads. And, and we see that during the Chauvin trial. Um, sometimes these folks, they just talk and state the obvious. Uh, we do a little something different here in Speaking Legally. We, we're talking about the things that really, really, really matter. And what do I mean by that? It may not be popular. It may not be the thing that we want to hear. But it is takeaways that you can use in a variety of situations. And as you know, um, this whole subject matter of civil rights, false arrest, police brutality, uh, excessive force, wrongful death is, is something that we have toned our skills on. And we are very, very, very um, knowledgeable in this area because one, we are people of color and subject to it. And we can talk about that and share some of that today. But we both practice in that area. And this is the area of law that you know i think about the importance of it the magnitude having a stake in it understanding it developing the area of law teaching it and so we want to use today as a teachable moment as we discuss tragic incidents with an s uh that pertain to unlawful stops or lawful stops that 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 go what we call to the left right so mm -hmm. Glad to have you. I, I, I want I want folks, our audience, to embrace uh, many of the comments that Royce just mentioned because what I believe they go to the heart to, and this is something that we had an earlier discussion on this week, was the idea that this is some sort of game or a competition between two teams, one the prosecution and one the defense during this Chauvin trial, is, 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 is just actually quite sad. I mean, in many of these uh, commentator uh, 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 viewings, you will see people talking about, oh, points for the defense, points for the prosecution. No, it's, it's, well, worse than, it's worse than that. It's worse than that because... Well, they, they, well what, they, I wanna, they, what I think, if, if I may, what I want to say is, is that there, this is all losers. There's no winners here. Exactly. This, this man died. You know, this idea that, you know, he, he somebody's winning and somebody's losing or somebody losing. No, everybody's losing here. You know, because at the end of the day, let's be honest, uh, whatever the payout was on the lawsuit, the citizens of Minneapolis and, and, and Minnesota are the ones paying for that. Okay. You have this man's life loss, his daughter's fatherless, this family is without their loved one. This 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 police officer may or may not go to prison. That's not really a win because it's not gonna bring uh, you know Mr. Floyd back to the living. So it's all losers, brothers. All 
Well, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, Dr. Grant, you know, trying homicides, that's what I used to say, right? There's no winners in trying to homicide. Someone goes to jail forever, you have a death before you, no one's coming back. And in those criminal cases, there is no compensation. But as you harped on something that we or brought to light to our audience, something that we have discussed on the sidebar is, is that we shouldn't get used to, oh, I want to hear what so-and-so last word is for the day and, and how some journalists will say, last word, Ed, a prosecutor won or lost today. Uh, last word, Doug, won or lost today. This is not PTI on ESPN, pardon my interruption, or some ESPN 60 minute, 30 for 30. Like you said, this is someone's life and we need to uh -huh. handle it delicately and we need to use any airspace as teachable moments. So go ahead, Dr. Grant. Yeah, I, I just, I appreciate what both of you all are sharing in the context of what we'll be talking about in the show. Number one, you've been, and you meaning both of you, have been addressing these issues throughout your career. And Mr. Russell, you wrote the book, Cardiac Arrest, and shout out to Terry who just bought two copies and sent one to um, daughter in, in Minneapolis. <laughs> I mean, Rich, thank you for being here. Deborah, thank you for being here. Stacy, thank you for being here. This, unfortunately, is not being lifted up in all of the forms where it needs to be lifted up because cardiac arrest addresses a lot of what we've seen played out. And you published that book in 2018. It's 2021. And look how much has happened in addition to what was cited in the book. The teachable moment is we have to put the resources and information in the hands of our community. No one is coming to save us. We have to save ourselves. And what we see play out here, the first thing that we're talking about today, it's awful, but it's lawful. That is an actual article that was written to talk about what we see happening in these cases over and over and over again. And the level of frustration that people of color are feeling you can't understand it unless you're someone of color. Let me just say, as a mother of two young black men, my heart is always beating fast when they're outside of my eyesight. Both of them drive. Both of them are tall black men. And what we see playing out is how scared society through the images that we ingest on media, on magazines, on the news, you would think, that every black person on the planet is some animalistic criminal that doesn't deserve to be treated as a human being. So when we get angry, when we get frustrated, when we hear the cries of yet another family, no one signs up to be in the news because they've lost their son. No one signs up to be on press conferences because their nephew has been murdered. No one signs up to be a part of these rallies and marches because they have nothing else to do. But when it's happening over and over and over again, you cannot imagine the level of trauma looking into the eyes of someone you brought into this world and see the pain that they face. The person you're married to, the man who helped bring me in the world as my father, every uncle, every cousin that is black and brown skin to be hated that much just because of the color of your skin or if not hated, feared. That's re really at the bottom of what we're seeing and what we're talking about. So I, I, I'm over the top with the, some of the sympathetic conversations. I know that's not usually my character, but I, I'm, I'm at my fill with what we're talking about. So I appreciate for this show, we're going a little bit deeper than the emotion that we're all feeling. But why is this happening? What is going on in our legal system? This whole article in the New York Times, awful but lawful. Yeah, you know, when you look at the when you look at the title, right? You look at the title, the title speaks volumes. And it speaks volumes because one, if we don't educate ourselves, and, and thank you, Terry, for purchasing cardiac arrest, by way of reading uh cardiac arrest or other materials to understand the law enforcement that dynamic between our community and law enforcement then something that you think is totally awful will always just be awful and you'll never really understand that it's lawful. So here's something that is awful, awful. And it's degrees, right? So here's something that's awful. You're driving, you stop. As soon as you stop, the police officer unholsters his gun, has a flashlight and he's pointing it at you. And you have your kids 
in the car. You have your loved ones in the car. You, for all intents and purposes, is mind your business, don't have any warrants, don't have anything. And you see this law enforcement officer with his gun drawn, pointed at you with a flashlight. That to me is awful. <laughs> that to me is awful. Uh, seeing it is awful. Experience it is awful. Watching it on any mode of social media. But as we see in cardiac arrest, a tattoo guide on how to handle unlawful police stops. And we may learn through seeing history repeat itself. It is lawful for a police officer to have his gun drawn and pointed at the vehicle if he's stopping a vehicle day, night, almost night, almost day. Because from the training perspective and from the police perspective, it is protocol to do that, that's number one, you're trained to do that, culture be damned. And number two, for safety reasons in that they do not know who they might be stopping. I have a lot of friends that are police officers. I have a lot of friends that are state troopers. I understand that. You never know who you might be stopping. So us on the receiving end, yes, this is awful. Us on the receiving end, educate ourselves and read enough attend the workshop, read cardiac arrest, understand what you're seeing in front of you, that it is lawful and put that to the side. If you can, I know it's hard, but try, put that to the side so you can manage, direct what is going on in front of you because of your reaction is, why the fuck he got the gun? Why we have to go there? And not understanding that that is what's going to happen on the best of days. And it is protocol and it's not illegal. And you're not going to get any W's. And if you go to court, just when he pulled his gun on me, understanding that can it give you some room to maybe assess in your mental space what else is going on. And as the title says, our legal system allows for the extrajudicial killing by police without real consequences. And that's the part that we're really trying to tackle and overcome, that there needs to be consequences financially, personally, and punitive by way of the Chauvin trial. Well, well, I, I, well you mentioned in the last show the, the U.S. Supreme Court Graham v. Connor case, which is what this article uh, appears to address in terms of the law allowing uh, for uh, this extrajudicial uh, level of killing that takes place um, because of the officer's objectively reasonable assessment that they're facing some sort of threat that they have to use uh, legal force against. Um, you know, the problem, of course, is, is a lot of these stops are, you know, they, they, they try to justify the stop itself, you know, that some sort of traffic infraction was committed but yet the real deal is is that you know there's a lot of racial animus behind these stops uh there's a hunch that oh maybe there's something else going on besides the 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 tail light or the or in the case of dante Wright, the the the, the air freshener hanging from the window so i, I mean this is this you know but can, can i can i push a pin in there for a minute just okay. because on this show we showed the incident what was it staten uh, island uh, where the cops were being daggone run over uh -huh. nobody pulled a gun nobody mm. had their hand on the holster but you're being attacked yeah. physically attacked by an individual in a crowd but your hand wasn't on the holster for that but for yeah. a traffic stop yeah no so awful this, belong this, there this is where we get into and, and once again, culture in the legal meeting, right? So the culture side, this is where we get into what I've said a thousand and one times. One, you definitely need a plan when you leave the household. There's no two ways about it. But although you don't have to accept your place in America, you need to know your place in America. And I'm not quite sure that folks that look like me and sound like me kind of know their place in America. Now, hear me again. You don't have to accept it but you should know it. Like we know that our lives don't mean anything to law enforcement. We look at all the killings that are going on. How can you not know that? 
we know that white folks, non-African American, non-Latino folks get treated differently than black folks. We know that. Can't hide under a rock. It is there. So I'm not blaming no victim, but I'm saying you need to know that. And if you don't know that, then that's a problem, number one. And number two, if you do know that, then the question becomes, what are you doing about it to tip the scales that work in your benefit? You know, a long time ago, someone told me common sense ain't so common. Here's a common sense that ain't so common. Police beat me. They kick my ass. They do whatever they do to me. I go to the precinct and I want to file a complaint with internal affairs. Internal affairs within the precinct. They going to bring you justice? Mm -hmm. <laughs> does, that, does, that, does, that sense, does that sense sound like common? Well, Right? Jerry's saying it right now. The problem is everything is objectively reasonable. The case law swings in favor of the police. White judges are creating these precedents that allow the police to kill. That's that's real talk for conversation. And then, you know, I appreciate the allies that are in support of what we're talking about way beyond all of the other parts of the movement. Well, I don't believe in this. And why are we talking about Black Lives Matter? Because clearly nobody is looking at what's happening. Does this happen in any other community? When, when they get pulled over for drunk driving, run people over and kill them, they get a slap on the wrist. They go, don't do that again next time. Be a little sharper than that, son. But we get hauled away. It's not equal. There's no equity in the justice system that is currently existing. And that's why we see what we see happening coming to a head. And unfortunately, the families that are now in the media's eye and spotlight are ordinary families minding their business, living their life that are now thrust in to speaking to issues that unfortunately their loved one has succumbed to. Like that, they were so, murdered. So Dr. Grant, so Dr. Grant, to your point, that is the floor. And we step on the floor every day that we know that white folks get treated differently than us. That is the floor. I hold us to task to say, all right, what are we going to do about that floor every single day? Not NBA style, National Basketball Association style, vote every four years, because what happens to 365 days times four when it's not time to vote, right? I'm talking about what are we doing today, tomorrow? How do we deal with that? And I'm telling you now, self-promotion is no promotion, but you have to understand the dynamics of the stop. So here's a dynamic. Dante, right, from all reports, said that he called his mother. That's an A++ in understanding I'm being stopped. I need to make this phone call. And he did, even though his girlfriend was sitting in the car. That's, 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 that's like standard. So there's a plan. I appreciate that. And once again, this is tough. This is tough to say and very hard to swallow. When he thought, or if he thought that he was being pulled over for the air freshener, at that moment, he knows his bullshit. Excuse my language. He knows something is, something is spoiled with the milk. We know this. We know that he knows this. He should know this. This goes back to what we've said in other shows, you know they're going to do a warrant check. And if you don't know, you should know. Right? So we shouldn't be shocked by that. And he should know whether or not there's something outstanding. Has nothing to do with his death. Officer totally wrong. Officer facing criminal charges. Was smart enough to resign. You know, given what I see here, you know, hopefully uh, a trial may be had and There'll be some punitive damages that'll happen. I know she could face up to 10 years on a manslaughter charge. Um, that needs to go forward. We know that there's going to be a lawsuit. And like Ed said, we're all losers. And if no, no amount of compensation can can make up for this young man's loss. Um, when I look at, the, look at what I know the facts to be based upon uh, reports, and I hear all this, oh, oh shit, I shot him. And I hear this taser, taser, taser. What rings to my head is the old, you know, 
uh, Three Cop Monty, where you see the officer beating somebody and saying, stop resisting, and the person ain't resisting. Taser, taser, taser. You got your gun out when your taser's on the other side of your hip. And your taser's your taser. yellow. It's not black. I right. mean, I don't, it, I don't it, understand it, if you it, have... It's in, not even, in front of you that you can't see what color it is. Right. And, and you have your gun in your dominant hand. So when I hear taser, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. I think you're trying to do some, as Ed says, some Jedi mind trick on oh, me. Oh, absolutely. You're trying, to, you're trying to do the, you know. And, and she's not a rookie. She's and, not a rookie. And not a rookie. Oh, so, you know what's interesting? I think I read she was the president of the union I mean, at one time. Without a question. Without a wow. question. And you it's, it's so unfortunate. But but can we just pause here for a minute? Yes, it's a traffic please. stop. He wasn't armed. That is he correct. He resisted, but he wasn't armed. So whatever went down at that point, as officers, the, all of them that were there, you mean to tell me that was the only way that that could have been handled? That's what training says to handle for a suspected so here, here's one more point to your point, right? This always cracks me up. You know, lucky I am dark skin and of African descent because some of the statements that our politicians make here in New York definitely crack me up and you would see my skin crack if I was another color. Uh, <laughs> you got de Blasio. He want to call out what happens in Minnesota. Really, de Blasio? When you got Kowalski Trawick, who was shot in his home by two police officers, and only thing the police officers had to do was to close the door and he was in his house cooking and you won't weigh in in the termination of either of those officers, but you're gonna comment as to what took place in Minnesota. This is, case is so analogous to, to Kowalski Trawick where that officer in the case that I'm talking about, Trawick matter, had his gun in one hand and a taser in another. We know that's not training to have both weapons in individual hands and have and have them out as if you put them. We know it's not training when your fellow more experienced officer says, put the taser away. We're not tasing anybody. And we make the analogy to this case here, the brother Wright, the officer that was doing the talking to uh, brother Wright, he didn't have his gun out. He, yeah. wasn't, he wasn't reaching for his weapon. He was handcuffed and he had a situation even when he went inside the car. He, he wasn't ready to to shoot first and ask questions later. So why are you coming on a, on the outside? Why are you putting your nickel in this quarter and firing? But she was training. So then what are you training? <laughs> what are you training? You're training him how to, how to shoot well, black well, well, in the well, death. That's what well, you well, 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 To that point, to that point, I don't know uh. if, if TV mimics life or life mimics TV. But I'll give a quick shout out to Queen Sugar. One of the episodes, <laughs> the officer, the white officer said to his black girlfriend that when he was a rookie, he participated in the stop where they beat some brothers down. And that officer said, and I know TV is not making this up. I know that this is just not coming out of some creative mind because I know that I've worked with folks when I was a prosecutor who were consultants to law and order. So they go and do their research. And so in this particular scene, he says that he felt bad that they beat this kid up and they beat him down. But his superior officer, who he was working with, told him, this is what we do. And this is what we call a down payment. And what he said was the down payment. She asked him, well, what do you mean by down payment? Well, if we catch him young and we beat him down early, analogous to slavery, that when they get older, they'll have respect for a police officer or at least fear us because they'll remember when they were 16, 15 years old and they got their, and they got their behind whipped by a law enforcement officer when they didn't do anything. So imagine what would happen when <sighs> they do something. I, I, so once again, is that is that TV mimicking life or is that life being reflected in TV and you take this case in point and you take the over policing and the aggressiveness at the end of the day, if Dante pulled away and drove his car down the road, you had a misdemeanor charge at best and a traffic violation. And you got a guy with handcuffs on his wrist that you can catch up with later because you wrote down his license and registration. You could see him tomorrow. What's the purpose? But, but even talking about 
life mimicking TV or movies and vice versa. Queen Sugar has had me crying all season long because the writers are so good. Like they're doing their research and they're talking about multiple issues, not just the police violence, but COVID-19 and everything that is, has impacted us. And what's key about what you're bringing up is the level of common practice. And, and I say that with a, a couching around it because I too have members of my family who serve on the police force, who are law enforcement and who do their job every day to serve and protect. But community policing, and you speak to that in cardiac arrest, we've spoken about that here on the show. If you're walking through a community and everyone looks like a suspect, how do you build rapport? How do you build feeling protected when the police come into your community and how you interact with them? And, and I think it's gone so far and wide that the view, the lens, the paradigm that black people are seen in as, oh, psh, they're going to end up in jail anyway, or they're going to do this, or they're going to do that. So there's no regard for who each person's child, who each person's family actually means to somebody else, because all black people are in one boat. We're, we're all monolithic. Every, everything is a problem. They're a problem. We're going to beat them down early so they'll get used to it by the time they get old. That show is talking about real life. It's talking and, and, about and, what happens. And what brings us to, and I'll let you uh, come in, Attorney Pichardo, what it brings us to is what we see played out right here with this officer putting our hand on the gun because that's what happened when there were no cameras when there was no social media, when there were no FaceTimes that people could call their parents and let them know what happened to how many brothers and sisters have been killed in this country and no news station carried it. Nobody knew about it except the family that suffered. But now due to social media and all this tech that we have, it's coming to the forefront. So some people, and I honestly feel, and I'm just gonna say this and close my comments for now. People, white people that I know, friends, individuals, some of them really were living in a cloud because they don't see the reality. They've never seen a George Floyd incident. They've never seen a, a, a Mr. Wright. They've never seen Trevonsky, uh, was it Trevonsky? Trey, Trey, I'm, Trey, 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 I'm Trey, angry Trey. right now, I can't even speak anymore. But they've never seen that. They've never seen what we're about to show with the Lieutenant being pulled over. It's not new America. This has been happening, but now it's getting more press and it's getting more attention. So they're like, oh my God, the police do that? Like, oh my, really? Like, what do you well, mean? Well, not, that? Not, not, only, not only that, Dr. Grant, there's something to be said for gentrification. You know, gentrification, as my good brother Pachado walks down, you know, down in Harlem or around Harlem, he see folks that are not normally in that neighborhood now living in that neighborhood. And when they live in that neighborhood, they see things that they wouldn't normally see when they live down in 96th Street. And so not only through social media, through their own eyes in real time, they are shocked and astonished. But one of the things we will realize is this, or at least I realize, and um, a matter of fact, I saw some, some folks writing some comments, but take this to heart. We can't wear bifocals, y'all. <laughs> we can't wear bifocals. We can't be that bad in, in our seeing can't be that bad and what do i mean by that we can't wear bifocals we can't complain about police and what they do to us and then when they're on trial we want to give them the benefit of the doubt we want we have a hard time convicting all of a sudden all this you know a salvation and deliverance church comes out of us because we can't accept the fact that this is how it goes down or we want to say nah a police officer wouldn't do that she yelled taser taser yeah really Really? Uh, I, I see him yelling, stop resisting, and the guy getting pummeled, and he's not doing anything. Well, I, I think I think a lot of this stuff comes down to power, power in the community and the accumulation of enough power to be able to exercise your own justice and be responsible for it. In this case here with Dante Wright, what I notice is, is that fr from what I've read is during the initial press conference, the mayor... Um, is speaking about this incident. He's there with the police chief. And the police chief, I guess, unscripted, immediately jumps to the defense of this officer and talks about how she appears to have thought that she had the taser in her hand versus the gun. And then when he's pressed by the media, he walks off the stage. And, and you know, the, 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 the uh, mayor's left kind of like, what was that about? And 
having to continue to address the media and that police chief uh, has to come back. And what hasn't been mentioned is, is that the officer resigned and shortly thereafter, so did the uh, police chief. Police chief. Right. As if like this massive right. protest, like, oh, you know, um, you know, if you if you guys gonna go after her, then 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 you know if you're if you're saying that this is wrong, well, I might you know kind of thing. Now I saw uh, uh, one of our viewers saying he's been fired. I I thought he resigned. E- either way, either way, you know, nonetheless he tried to justify what she did, and and you know this whole idea of this blue wall and them trying to justify because trust me, the way this went down. A lot of these law enforcement individuals, unfortunately, are going to try to justify this by saying, oh, he shouldn't have he shouldn't have tried to to flee. Listen, folks, Mm -hmm. at the Mm -hmm. end of the day, this was a traffic stop, no matter what, no matter what. If he tried to flee, like you said, is not the point because you don't know what you're doing. You're scared. We don't know what other touches he's had with the, the criminal justice system and he just panicked. Well, and who knows panic, what type of traumatic experience he might have had when he was in custody. I mean, you know, and, and, and like Roy said earlier, this is an individual that you had ample opportunity to later apprehend, take into the custody if need be, and and and, and deal with it in, in, a, in a more reasonable fashion, not to you know, execute him right off the spot for this. Not to kill him. And, the and, 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 I, and, I, and I think this continues to go back. I think one of the conversations here is, should law enforcement be doing these traffic stops? These traffic stops. But before we get to the traffic stop, okay. let's address the warrant, because the warrant keeps coming up. I see, Stacey, you had a com- uh, comment that he had a warrant. So what if he had a warrant? He had a warrant. And there are a lot of times we have warrants, something that we talked about previously on the show, that you get warrants for stupid things and for lack of a better explanation and you don't address it. So it's out there on you. It doesn't mean that you've done some high crime, that you've killed people or that you've some egregious act. It means that you have a warrant because you haven't addressed and done your due diligence with showing up in court. Not only that, 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 when you do the search for the warrant, it will tell you what the warrant is for. If he had a warrant, for a misdemeanor, that's a year or less in jail, right? It'll tell you if it's domestic violence. And it's my understanding he had a warrant because he failed to pay fines. He had a fine. Either it doesn't justify what took place. If, if, I, if I may, this warrant could have been for a much more severe offense. But the bottom line is the definition of a warrant is a summons or an order to appear that was violated. And so your appearance before a magistrate for a judge is required. That is the very beginning of due process. This individual has not been convicted of anything, has not been found guilty of anything, you know, um, and, and, and even if the warrant is say for parole violation or whatever, that would have meant that, you know, at some point the court decided to sentence him, but allow him to be uh, a free. In any case, in, in, in any in any case, he is not someone that is deserving of a punishment of death, which is what this ended up resulting in at the end of the day. Okay, however it is that you try to slice it in terms of you know a warrant, a warrant is a warrant is a warrant. And, 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 and to your point, warrant doesn't equal violence. Warrant doesn't equal escapee. Warrant means what it means as you define it. Warrant, you fail to do something. Whether that failure was intentional or by accident, it is only a failure to do something. That does not make you a bad person. And, 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 not, and not only that, it wasn't that he was attacking these officers. Okay, let's keep that in mind, too. It's not that, oh, you know, the officer has to reciprocate with an equal level of violence. That's that's not what's happening here. This guy is moving. First of all, I, I don't understand what the hell happened. Why he's standing there, this officer is placing cuffs, and then all of a sudden this thing goes left, as I like to say, and this young man is able to wiggle away and get in a car and flee. So now we're shooting fleeing suspects in the back or... or we're, we're, we're trying to kill those who, 
uh, uh, aren't, one, one, aren't one, presenting one, a threat. I mean, one of the police officers' major responsibility is safety to civilians. So if he's getting in a car and he's looked like he's speeding away, so you shoot him knowing that there's other people in the car, exactly. number one, knowing that if you shoot him, it's likely that there's going to be an accident, somebody else gets injured, safety number two. So this goes back to over-policing and to my non-color friends who look at this and, and, and think it's horrible, they only think it's horrible. They're not embarrassed by it. They're not ashamed by it. See, you see, this is culture cover. What I call culture cover is for real. Somebody in our community does something that's embarrassing, that's ridiculous. As a culture, we feel a certain way about it. We're like, oh shit, man, you had to mess up when Steve Harvey messed up Miss America or whatever he was doing. <laughs> you know, everybody of color felt that. Everybody felt that. They're like, oh my God. Damn, man. Steve. <laughs> we ain't never going to get another shot now. Come on. We felt we took it on. We take it on as a race. We take every single thing that we do individually as one. That has its good points, that has its bad points. And that shows you the state of affairs of black folks in America. White folks, they don't have that. A white white person shoes, they ain't nobody embarrassed about that. Ain't nobody feeling it's bad. It happened, it's, it's, it's horrific, it's horrible, but nobody's feeling like if there's no other law enforcement that is feeling like, you know, when an NFL player gets caught, you know, beating up a wife, domestic violence, or getting caught with drugs, other NFL players feel that. They're like, come on. And as a person of color, they feel that. There's none of that here. It's just, it's, it just doesn't exist. So, you know, right now, you call another law, a law enforcement guy, they would say, yeah, that's bad. That's fucked up. That, that's all they would say. That's it. And- it's it's so much, and of course our our, our show is limited. I, I definitely want to just circle back on getting your input on the police pretext traffic stops, uh, saying that needs to end. Will that change things? I think one of our viewers, and shout out to everyone that's here, Tony Rolanda, we see you, Monica. Thank you for being here, Jerry and Stacy. We appreciate all your commentary because it adds to the discussion. At the end of the day. We can't solve all the world's problems on speaking legally 4 p.m. every Wednesday. But what we can do is raise the consciousness of conversation. What we can do is talk about the facts and not act as if people's lives are a scoreboard, that everybody in this community is suffering. There's a loss on all angles. And how can we be educated enough so that we raise the policy issues and the change? I think Jerry was the one that said it earlier. You know, who's making the laws? Who is creating these standards by which we operate? Are we over-policed or are they occupying our community? Like this is real talk. 2021 is a continuation of what we start, what we saw start in 2020 with the height of where we are with these particular kind of cases. We don't want to be here talking about another life that has been taken from police misconduct. Yes, there are lives being taken for other reasons all over. We can't solve everything at one time and let's not lump it all together. But for this cause, something has to change. When the very people that are here to serve and protect you are killing you, there is a problem and we need to talk about it. So do we feel if there is some change in how police answer traffic stops, would that help? Was that gonna make a difference? See, you know, I I wanna be very careful of taglines and catchy articles in reference to what the article says as opposed to what the article is about, right? So you heard defund the police. It was a catchy tagline and folks ran with it. But what it was actually about was something more more concrete, something more effective, but we couldn't get away from that, right? And so now when you hear uh, police should do away with traffic stops, I don't I don't believe that that's going to solve the problem, right? So you do away with traffic stops. Our communities are being over policed. No if and buts about it. Our community is is made up of officers that are occupying and not part of the community. There is no community policing. So whether it's a traffic stop, whether it is um what we call a health and wellness wellness check, I've watched police officers in the projects 
come because 911 said, you know, someone is falling sick or, you know, might be a suicide. And they bang on the door as if they're trying to get somebody who robbed the bank. It is that. Well, 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 well. Well, I think I think I think the idea here is not is not too far flung from that. The idea that do you have an individual who is going to the scene to basically exercise a certain level of violence or to subdue somebody, or or do you have somebody come into the scene who's trained to cal to calm the situation down? to really truly deal with the situation for what it is, be it a mental health call. Do you have a police officer who's trained in dealing with people who suffer from mental illness and is going to be sensitive to that and is going to calm the situation down? Or are you going to have somebody coming with no training? It's going to be like, get down, stay down, don't move. And, 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 and shooting the person as soon as they make some furtive gesture, they refuse to just do what the officer is asking them to do. Okay, so now we get to the traffic stop, right? You have someone that is being stopped because of a violation. You got violations, you got misdemeanors, and you got felonies. Violations, ordinance violations being the lowest on the totem pole. We're talking about a fine. In some cases, yet imprisonment, but not more than 30, 90 days, uh, uh, maybe a year, but... I mean, come on. The reality is we're talking about basically something monetary, you know, a, a sort of civil penalty, if you will. Why is it now turning into something lethal now? You stopped me for a broken taillight. Now you're pulling me out of the car because you believe that there's some crime that I may or may not be committing. And now something goes wrong and you shoot me by mistake because you thought you grabbed your taser, but you really... Yeah grabbed your gun my 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 thing is is that my my thing is is that we should at the very least engage in the conversation and explore the possibility of having someone other than regular law enforcement police enforcing the VTL we do it with the parking violations where we have a certain division of the police department that's in charge for giving the parking tickets we have uh, the TLC police that stops the uh, cab drivers when they're committing a certain infraction. We have the sanitation police, right, that kind of give you the infractions for not having the right recyclables outside. Once again, we're talking fines. We're talking violations. Let's, let's stay right there with that. Let's stay right there with the fact that you've outlined a couple of things that people are not trained to handle certain situations when it deals with mental health, all the other challenges that we see. This, this goes to a bigger issue. What do we really fund in our communities? Where are the resources to prevent people from having touches with criminal justice? Where are the opportunities for us to really look at how we are electing people to advocate for a healthy and safe environment, no matter where you live, that you can still have some of the things that we don't see in certain communities that we see in others. Where's the equity in that? So it's a broader discussion. But what I wanna jump into is the fact that we are talking about a traffic stop because something allegedly happened. And then there was discussion on, oh, he shouldn't have ran, he shouldn't have done anything. Here is a situation where it's someone who is serving this country on active duty and did not run, did not go anywhere. And I'm gonna play this because this thing had me so angry. Everything that we see happening, it, it, it cuts me at the core and every other mother that has any ounce of what it feels like to see someone that you gave birth to die unnecessarily. But this, he didn't run. Help me understand what we're seeing here. And it's it's not the, the the volume isn't all the way up. Let me see if it'll it'll play. No, well, two, things, two things, Dr. Grant. And we'll oh. never be able to help you understand what we see here. What we see here is ridiculous. But but let's listen. You're being detained for obstruction justice. Violation. I do not have to get out. You have me in trouble. Really? Get your hands off me. 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 Back up there. Sir, get out of the car now. Hey, get out of the car now. Sir, you look, trying to get out. Okay, I'm trying to As he tried to unlock his door. Get out. Old unlock the door. 
Now, this is not how you treat a vet. Uh, I'm actively serving this country, and this is how you're going to treat me. I didn't do anything. Whoa, hold on. What's going on? Hold on. Mace spraying it. Keep on. Get out of the car now. Get out of the car now. Sir, just get out of the car. Get out of the car now. And why should he have to get out of the car? Get, oh, get out of the car and get on the ground now. And get, get, get. I, I Active this. serving this country. Take your seatbelt off and get out of the car. With his daughter in the, the back seat. Now. He can't even see. Mm. Take off your seatbelt and get out of the car. Jerry just said he's your frat brother, Royce. You're going to do what you're can told. You pause, can you pause that for a second? Is there any way that you can pause that? I can't. All right, so, so pause that right there. So um, getting back to educating oneself and knowing the rules of the role, right? I do not profess that there is one golden rule. If you do certain things, that it, this would never happen to you. You have to minimize your exposure. He's done everything that he should do. But also, there has to be an assessment. And I broadly say that there's four types of police officers, quota, prejudice, classes, and power. So you pick which one this guy is when you realize how irrational this person is at this point. And, and one, think, oh, you know, he, he doesn't even care whether or not there's a bomb in the back or whether there's children. All he wants is to get him out of the car. He's not listening to me. That's that's what's going on. He's challenging my authority. He's not listening to me. So get out of the car. 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 Get on the ground. Like, why am I getting on the ground now? Like, like how do we jump to that? Well, what? I didn't play that part yet because we, we paused it here. Yeah, yeah, keep on going. He, he was pulled over. And if I if it's the story is correct, whether they thought something with his plates or registration, that's why they yeah. pulled him over. Yeah. It wasn't yeah, yeah, because yeah. of a warrant or anything of that nature. And then when we get angry, folks wonder why. Take your seatbelt off and get out of the car. Don't reach her, Daniel. Don't reach her. Please. Okay, you hear the contradictory orders. Don't reach in there. This is really messed Take up. off the seatbelt. Take off the seatbelt, but his hands are up. So how's the seatbelt? Is just going to magically unbuckle itself? Well, he's also he's also being quite prudent in that he seems to understand that if he goes and starts reaching towards his waist, he might get shot because of that. And, and, and to the abuse of authority and abuse of power. So he takes his seatbelt off. You don't have a right to search the car. So where are we going with this? Like, what's the end game? The end game is that you have to give him a ticket. There is no, and you have to give him a ticket. If even if you want to charge him with disobeying an officer, mm -hmm. uh, not, a, not a abiding by a lawful order, that's still a summons, at least in New York. Wherever this is, I can't imagine that it's any- It's Virginia. It's Virginia. Let me continue. Take your seatbelt off. What are you, a specialist corporal? What are you? I'm a lieutenant. Lieutenant, get out of the car. And then had the nerve to. I got to pause right there. You got the nerve to ask him. Okay. Well, well, first of all, first of all, Ooh. Dr. Grant, you, 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 you shouldn't be but so irate because Ooh. there are there are law enforcement officers that are within your arm reach that have retired and will tell you how other law enforcement officers treat them once mm -hmm. you retire. You're not a member of the service anymore. You whatever. I don't care who you are, especially if you're a person of color. Well, there's a history in this country of active duty, veteran, member or for active or former member of the military being attacked, maimed, killed, regardless. The bottom line is, is that if you're a man of color in this country, be you a police officer, they're undercover black police officers who get shot while they're undercover the minute that some white police officer sees them with that gun because they automatically believe that that individual is somebody who is to be feared and or hated and is deserving of being killed. It, it could go as far as them feeling like, well, you're, you're not really a member of the military. I don't care if you have that uniform on. You could have bought that at the Army and Navy store. I mean, the bottom line is, is that you get treated no 
different. You get treated well, me, no different. I'll, I'll finish this up so that we can just see how this played out to the point where it was oh. recorded. You made it way more difficult than it had to be. You just comply. Get out of the car. Uh, Woo, right there. Power cop. You made this way more difficult if you would just comply. Do you even hear the tone in his voice? Oh, my Lord. We have one more minute of this. Now, 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 now he said that the reason why he ended up at that gas station, because they originally tried to stop him in a dark, no, mm -hmm. no lid or, or very little light area. And he drove to that area and stopped. And now here, here's a teachable moment on that. And at that point, he did the right thing. I'm going to drive to the area where it's lit. I'll add on to that. Tip to take for everybody as you go away, and we end this show at some point, right? That's when you make the call of nine one one, and you say, "I'm pulling over at X gas station. I have police officers following me." So this way, that then goes over the air. The police officers who are following you hear that you have now called that in to a dispatcher, and now <coughs> you have another ear witness as to what is going on. And that I, all, only way that dispatcher will get off the line is if the officers that are pursuing them then says, cancel that call. We got it under control. We have to keep on moving in the direction that we protect ourselves. You got to keep on moving in that direction. And that's part of what you lecture on and talk about in cardiac arrest. Like mm -hmm. these are some of the things that we can tactically do beyond being clearly emotional about it. And I know today I've had an emotional day. This is hitting me different. I, it, it's enough is enough, but I'm gonna play the rest of this. Get out of the car. Straight out of the ground. Straight out the ground. Now, why do we, we, why you gotta be on the ground? Now, now let's go. <laughs> he was asking for his commanding officer. See, he was doing all the things that you talk about in cardiac arrest, trying to figure out who's in charge, who he needs to call. Hey, let's go. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Get on the ground now. Get on the ground. All he wants to do is get into submission. Power, get on the ground. Get on the ground. Get on the ground now. Please talk to me. Get on the ground. Please talk to me about what's Yes, sir. I hope they get fired and lose every dime of their pension. Why am I getting kid like this? Why? Because my co-op is on the ground. And they're forcing him to get on the ground. Why? That is not fear of safety. Stop. That is not fear of safety. Active <laughs> lieutenant. <laughs> With his daughter in the car. And pet in the car. Now, now, please, you know, this This is where the patience level for all of us, we have different points where we just get to the boiling point and enough is enough. What we try to do here, speaking legally, where the cultural meets the legal, is also just share with you some of the tactical things that you can do in light of the fact that Mr. Russell says it all the time. It's not if it's going to happen, when it happens. What can you do? And there's no guarantee that things will work in one line. If you do this, then X will happen. And why this is not an algebraic uh, equation. It, it, there's so many different dynamics. But the problem is we're not having the right conversations in the right places with the right people to make the change. And hopefully that shifts so that we can hold people accountable. Because what happens? They get a slap on the wrist. They know that the union is going to protect them. They know that they're going to still have their retirement. They're going to still have all their pension money. And, oh, well, black people will get mad for two days and then they'll quiet down. Or there might be a protest or a march and then that will end. So, so everybody, everybody should know universally, right, that if you have a license plate and you have a cover over it, plastic, you can get stopped for that. If you have something that says bought from Honda and it's covering part of your state, like you can tell that it says New York, you can tell that it says Pennsylvania because you've been looking at license plates all your life that you know that that's from North Carolina. But if it's covering part of the NC or the NY, you can get stopped. So anybody out there, they got it, Kappa Alpha Psi Omega, you know, Amway bestseller of the year, and that's around the frame of your license plate, and it is covering any part of an officer seeing and viewing what state that plate is from, you can get stopped and you can get pulled over, right? Now, teachable moment. When you go pick up the car from uh, Open Cadillac or Honda dealer, and they put the, you know, Paul Richards, they put their little thing, Paul Miller on the back, Audi, Paul Miller, Miller, they don't ever tell you that, hey, you know what? 
you really need to take that off because that's marketing for them. They don't ever tell you like, hey, look, you can get stopped for that and get a fine for that. So if we do not read enough to educate ourselves enough, we will all, now look, I, I'm annoyed too when someone stopped me, when they used to stop me because the frame was ever, I'm like, you of all the things, that's what you're stopping me from? But at some point you have to realize that I need to, just like we need to be better, we need to run faster, we need to move in a certain way of social media because you know uh, our past can bite us in the ass, right? We've heard that saying before, right? So we have to do certain things to be better. We have to do certain things to play this game of chess and not checkers. Well, one, one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about that, you know, maybe for another show we can talk a little bit more about is this whole area of these pretextual stops, that the stop isn't really for the traffic violation. It's for something else. Not a question. And how do we deal with that legally? You know, you have a, a U.S. Supreme Court decision that allows this to happen. How are the courts dealing with that? You know, in, in, in Washington, they, they have a standard that they use that, that doesn't necessarily apply what the uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, states, or rather they use a standard that gets around it. And maybe we should contemplate using that here in the state of New York and sort of strictly following that U.S. Supreme Court decision. I mean, Jerry Graves mentioned earlier these judges, you know, and the way they are applying the law. These judges are elected to office. Let's keep that in mind. So we have to start paying attention to who we put on the bench as and, well and, as who and, the and, DA and, is who charge. And, 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 and to that point, judges being appointed and Jerry Graves comment, and you can continue. We can extrapolate this and make this analogous to any employment matter. Yeah. You, you know what it's like to bring a case of discrimination, a patent in practice is built against you. This is not new. It's built against you. It's for the institution. Yeah. Recognize it. And now we have the plan to deal with it. I'm sorry to cut you off. Go ahead, brother. No, no. Listen, man, it's it's real. That's why I mentioned a little earlier. It's an all around power dynamic. The people in power who are making the decisions, who are not only passing the law, but interpreting the laws. You know, you have legislators who pass the laws. You have the judges who interpret them. You got lower court judges. You got upper court appellate and and and. and in the highest court in the land on the Supreme Court. Those judges are appointed by the president. We just had a, 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 a monster who, 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 uh, who appointed several, several judges to the Court of Appeals that we're going to be dealing with that for, for, for you know, the remainder of our, our lives, certainly, and for a good part of the lives of our children. You know, and the decisions that are going to be coming down from those people. And that's why it's important that we look at what is the progressive and others are saying is that maybe there needs to be a term limitation on Supreme Court justice. Maybe there needs to be an age limitation. Maybe you can't be on the Supreme Court until you're 99 years old. Maybe at the age 85 or 90, you got to go. Um, I mean, that's the conversation. That is the insider's conversation that needs to happen. You're not going to put another judge on there. That's probably unrealistic. But what is the what is the compromise? No, listen, if, listen. If, if the Congress wants, they can add additional judges to even the score. What happened with this current makeup is completely unfair. Merrick Garland should have gotten his appointment. He yeah. should have gotten his appointment. That that was that was that wasn't was right. That's another show. That that's a whole another show and conversation to get into. And let's let's push a pin in it to really bring that up because it comes back. To I don't know. We may have we may have to get on tomorrow because Ed is ready. <laughs> Ed is ready. You start talking Supreme Court and moving on. Be I think tomorrow at four o'clock we might have to do a special <laughs> issue. I think Ed is ready. I ain't not, uh, ready. No one uh, he's not. No one these wearing a dark sheet. Uh, he's not a dark sheet. Ed, he gotta let it go. Long live Wakanda. That's right, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I appreciate the fact that we have created this space, you know, in the midst of unprecedented times that we were witnessing in COVID-19, we launched Speaking Legally. And we've been here with you through every incident that we've witnessed through the pandemic, through the challenges, the ups and the downs. And we will be here with you. And we just ask you to stay here with us. Give us your feedback. Share the information. If you've listened and you're like, wait, I need to add some content to this conversation. I need to maybe have a conversation with my family and share this with the co-hosts that are here today because we all have a part to play. We're not going to solve it by ourselves in a vacuum. 
It's more conversations, more opportunity for us to create legislation to impact who we elect. We still have the power of the vote, even tr even though they're trying to suppress it and stop us from being able to vote. That's a whole nother Georgia, show. Georgia. They're, they're, uh, they're mad because Stacey Abrams, she didn't get better. She got better and she organized and totally changed the game. Hold on, so hold on, hold on. Let, me, let me write that down. She didn't get better. She got better. <laughs> yeah, I gotta get, you know, we got to get down easy. Yeah, you know? Chimes and rhymes, man. She gave it, she gave it up. We got the female in C in the house. <laughs> All right. Put me down. That's what we do in the box. You know, that's, that's how we do. But anyway. I thank you all for tuning in. You know we're here 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Wednesday. Our two legal experts, this is not what they play in real life. This is what they do in real life. They're in the courtroom litigating on behalf of our community on these issues, helping families to have some sort of recourse after they have been violated in a variety of ways. So stay connected with them. Go and check out their website. Definitely purchase a copy of Cardiac Arrest. This is the work that they do. This is what they live and breathe. This is the oath that they took to be able to help us in our community navigate these waters. And until such time, we gather again, stay safe, be well. The coronavirus is not gone. So Let please. Me, can, I, can I just say one thing before we leave? And, uh, and this is my, my goodbyes for the day. One, I want to just say uh, my heart goes out every April 10th to the family of Ramali Graham, son. Uh, Ramali died April uh, 12th uh, and by, by an unlawful shooting uh, by a police officer, a wrongful death. I wanna give praises and a shout out to Kawasi Trawick. Today uh, is his birthday. Today is like, oh, wow. 14th, excuse me, anniversary, the anniversary of his death, April 14th. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I want to give a, you know, prayers and wishes and spirituality to the family, uh, to the Trawick family. And what I want to say is one, I want to give a shout out to my main man, Wayne Will from 671 and St. Mary's Projects. And his, his quote that he gave to me for the day, which is so appropriate when, it, when we think about cardiac arrest, a tactical guide on how to handle unlawful police stops. You have to read something before you need something. And on top of what Dr. Grant said, don't be bitter, be better. Here's one more for you. Don't be panicked, be prepared. <laughs> All right, you got that one, Mr. Uh, Russell. Don't be prepared. <laughs> All right, he got one in today, Ed. He got one in. <laughs> well, everyone, we'll see you next week. Thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you. Thank you for your prayers, Rich. We need it. You know, it's heavy. Uh, to whom much is given, much is required. And we're here to do our part to change the narrative and effectuate change. Stay power to the people. See you all next week.